there are, I'd have to say there are two reasons species become extinct. They're what we might call the proximate reason, what happened right now, that caused there to be no more of that species. And then there's the ultimate reason, what really happened that caused this whole process. So the proximate reason might be something like, um, well, hunters shot the last one and now there aren't any more, or we hunted them, or we fished them into extinction, or something like that. Um, but the ultimate reason really is the organism that was under some kind of stress was unable to adjust to that stress in the amount of time that it had. And that's why it went extinct. So ultimately, there wasn't enough time to adjust. So in the case of a bacteria, uh, that would be 20 minutes because a bacteria can reproduce in 20 minutes and produce the next generation. So if there is a mutation for surviving that stress, <clears throat> give them 20 minutes and they'll have some resistant survivors. Um, but in the case of uh, humans, well, we need 15 to 20 years to produce the next generation. Now, the catch is that for any species to adapt, it might be a hundred generations. Well, that's tomorrow for bacteria. It's maybe later today. For us, that's uh, 1,500 years from now. Um, so we aren't adapting very fast, and they adapt, bacteria adapt very fast. So there's a difference in, in, in how much time we have to respond. So any species that's gone extinct probably didn't have enough time to respond given how fast it could produce the next generation. So uh, as a consequence, big things go extinct fast and small things don't go extinct as fast. Um, and some people might not be satisfied with that answer as like the ultimate reason things go extinct, but ultimately that's the reason. They couldn't adapt fast enough. Well, after World War II, <clears throat> there was suddenly available to farmers um, pesticides, synthetic pesticides and synthetic herbicides. This was also true in the medical world. Suddenly, there were all of these medicines that, that we created as a result of the medical care that we had to provide to injured soldiers. So a lot of breakthroughs occurred. Uh, in World War II, but after World War II, all of those things became available to the general public. So farmers got pesticides and farmers got fertilizers. All this leftover nitrogen from making bombs was now available for making plants. And so we went into commercial agriculture at a much different rate, from a different angle. We could do things on a bigger scale. And so we started applying pesticides in particular on everything. And DDT was the number one pesticide applied immediately after World War II. Uh, and so, and it was a miracle drug essentially for farmers. So <clears throat> you spray that stuff and your pests go away for five years or so. And then they all come back. Uh, and that's okay, we'll keep using the, but the DDT, but it, it was less effective and then less effective and then it really didn't work after seven to eight years. So by the early 1950s, DDT didn't work anymore. And that was because the pests that we were trying to eradicate, we, we never actually eradicate. No pest has ever been eradicated. Um, we can reduce the numbers dramatically, but we can't get every last one. And if you don't get every last one, then you've got a problem because those few that don't die probably didn't die for a reason. They probably didn't die because, well, that chemical doesn't kill them. And so they reproduced because they were, they had the whole agricultural field to themselves now and they grew rapidly and in vast numbers and all of their offspring had the same basic characteristics the parents did. Parents were resistant, the offspring are resistant and there you go, we've got resistant pests. And we managed to do this several hundred times over the next couple of decades and prove to ourselves that yes, it works every single time. Um, and all of this started it was a bit of a snowball rolling downhill. It started immediately after World War II and has just gained speed ever since. The response to basically failing with DDT was, should have been, oh, that doesn't really work <clears throat> because we only get a couple of years without the pests and then they're back and they're stronger than ever. 
But instead, our decision was, well, let's try to make better chemicals. Well, there aren't too many chemicals that are better than DDT at killing insects. It's, it's probably the best chemical that was ever made. <clears throat> but our response was, we can make it better and stronger. And so we did. We went after bigger and better chemicals. Then the results were the same. <clears throat> The difference, uh, perhaps, though, was that we changed the intensity of our attack. And we quickly found out the intensity doesn't make any difference. Well, it makes a difference in a sense. It speeds it up. So <clears throat> where we can use chemicals to kill some of the pests or most of the pests, if you increase the intensity, you can get almost all. But that just means that the ones that are left behind are totally resistant and their offspring will be totally resistant and then you speed up the process of creating a resistant pest. And so that's what agriculture essentially got into was this economies of scale where we go into big monocultures, gigantic fields and spray uniform application of chemicals on those fields and if there is any mutation for resistance out there, by golly, you will find it. Um, and it will take over. Um, in the past, with family farms with small plots, and you know they might have 100 acres in 10, 20 different crops, instead of having 10,000 acres in a single crop, we just, we just were never going to see that kind of response. But when we went to these big, big, modern, agricultural, large-scale uh, approaches to growing food, we saw pesticide resistance almost overnight. Well, <clears throat> going to large-scale farms is driven by a number of different factors, uh, economics in particular. Um, Small-scale farms typically were family farms. They were growing food for themselves. If they had leftover food, they could sell it, they could barter it, they could use it to generate a little cash for the family. But mostly they were feeding themselves and then hoping for some extra. Um, <clears throat> a number of changes took place the John Deere plow was a good example. Uh, the John Deere plow allowed the Midwest to be plowed. Uh, prior to that, it couldn't be because the plow cut deep enough to actually get down to the soil, and the John Deere plow could be credited with transforming the Midwest. And then large, large expanses of farms could be made uh, that were bigger than the old family farm. Uh, and that just, that just entails a whole different approach toward agriculture. Uh, if there's large expanses of farm, they have to be treated differently. It's one crop. It, uh, it's growing all at the same time. We want more uniformity of the crop so we can harvest once, not twice. So we get it all the first pass. We don't leave some on the ground. So that um, if we have a pest problem, we can spray the whole field and not, and not do the old labor-intensive process of walking through the field and spraying here and there and doing that every week. Just treat everything very uniformly. And in fact, that encourages pest resistance, but at the same time, it's efficient and uh, can be more cost effective. It often takes large pieces of machinery too. So as we move toward that system, we encouraged commercial farming that could afford big pieces of equipment, that could afford the repairs and the diesel to run these machines and, and could grow things that didn't necessarily make lots and lots of money but there's enough acreage out there so that it in fact made a lot of money because of the acreage, but it couldn't work well on a small scale. So a number of different economic factors sort of playing together until we end up with the giant farms that we have today that really are focused on commodity crops rather than food crops, but um, giant monocultures of those crops. Using the word intense farming is a good word because intensity is what has really changed over the years. We are attempting to, to force the land to produce more and more food. We're using fertilizer to assist that. We're, we're attempting to eliminate losses due to pests. We're trying to get more than ever before out of the land and intensity is really the approach. And then the rest of that approach is um, uh, 
large scale approaches, uh, uniform crops, uniform genetic uh, variation in the crops and that sort of thing. Um, the intensity, uh, increasing intensity um, also means, um, well, it's this use uniformity process, this problem of uniformity. To do this in an economical way, we can't have patches of farm. We can't have uh, a little bit here and a little bit there and it's scattered. It needs to be one big, big farm. And to do that, we need to eliminate all of the other uh, wildlands around and convert that to big patches so that we can run tractors and straight lines and, and, and do this very quickly and easily and efficiently. And so we push back the wildlands and we convert our agricultural fields to a, to a single crop. Um, and the result is a farm that has one species growing on it, the crop. We don't want anything else out there. We want no bugs, no birds, no, we don't want anything. We want to be able to control every aspect of the growth of that one crop. And everything else interferes with that, in essence. And so that's essentially why modern farming has pushed biodiversity, wildlands, anything um, that isn't directly involved in producing that crop away from the farm. We actually could have used the word farm ecosystem in the past. I don't think you can do that now. On the small family farm with multiple crops, small patches of multiple crops, you can use that word. There are birds and butterflies and bees and insects, and, and they feed they are different pests eating different foods, but then there are different predators eating those different pests, and, and the whole uh, landscape supports that biodiversity. Now it's not native biodiversity by any means, but it is farm biodiversity and we've moved completely away from that. So there is zero biodiversity. <music>